his father was an engineer, a railroad engineer, a uh, fireman rather, not an engineer. And uh, so you can imagine what the old man looked like when he came home at night. And uh, he just grew up in this atmosphere where his heroes all had baggy pants. Yeah. And going back into the Civil War period, of course, this was the, the great period of that kind of clothing. And the uh, uh, you mentioned that he could draw dead people that who actually yeah. look like dead people. It's hard to draw dead people. It is because, why? Uh, uh, for one thing, a, a dead person just settles into the place he is wherever he is, hanging over a parapet or lying flat on the ground. Where the inclination always is to draw the, the body still like this, and when the life, the air, and everything goes out of a body, it does that. It settles down just like a deflated, deflated balloon. Oh. Everything stops, and, and uh, he could make it look like everything had stopped. Uh, and it's, a, it's a situation you find yourself in uh, mm. any time that you have to, to do illustration, because you're always drawing somebody, shooting somebody, or like that, especially mm. at the beginning. Now, about the time of the 75th birthday party, Bud Sickles was in Arizona working on oil paintings, western paintings. This is how his, uh, the last few things he did in his career was western paintings. Mm -hmm. Had you seen any of these paintings? Oh yes, uh, I've seen several of them and I had, I had slides and uh, stats and what, uh, of others. But the important thing was that Bud had found a market for this after the illustration market fell apart. And color photography just knocked the pants off of it. Of newspaper illustration and magazine illustration and really kind. And he simply couldn't make a living at it. And he was one of the best. Yes. But uh, he was getting good prices for his paintings at, at last. It took about a year. And uh, he has, as of this minute, four paintings at the Biltmore Gallery in L.A. And he really died with his boots on, then, so to speak. He had a drawing on his board. When he, he collapsed on his drawing board. This is this is as close to dying with your boots on as you can. He fell down beside the drawing board, hmm. and his wife couldn't get him out from behind, under the thing. Oh so she God. called a neighbor who helped her. Then they called the paramedics and took him to the hospital. He died in the hospital. Well, I'm sure that uh, he's going to be appreciated and by future generations. I hope so because he wasn't really appreciated by the younger generations, except those of us who were nuts on the subject. But uh, he did nothing whatever to promote his own cause. He loved to be around people. He loved. Uh, he was not a recluse in any sense. Mm -hmm. But he simply would not do the kinds of things that we all do. Selling is part of the art, shall we? You know? Oh, yes. And, uh, it sometimes takes only one person to make one of these people famous for generations right, to come. Like Theo Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh's brother. If it wasn't for his brother, nobody would have known about Vincent Van Gogh because he didn't sell one painting in his lifetime. Yes, exactly. Uh, and it took a long time to bring that about. Uh, Boswell on Dr. Johnson is a good example. Yeah. If Boswell hadn't written about Dr. Johnson, I'm sure his dictionary wouldn't have sold as well as it did. <laughs> <laughs> well, to get back to that wonderful weekend at Ohio State, uh, on Sunday, on the very, on your very birthday, uh, Lucy had arranged for uh, the Ohio State uh, Glee Club to sing some songs. Can you describe that afternoon and the cake yeah. cutting? The cake was a big cake. Not, it wasn't one of those phony things with a, a cardboard underneath. It was a real cake all the way through. It tasted good. I got about one or one and a half inches of it <laughs> because there were a lot of other customers. But anyway, it was a big cake that they have at weddings and celebrations of that sort of course. Uh, a woman, a wonderful woman, uh, known, whose name is Joe Thaler, uh, who lived around the corner from the Sigma Chi house, was, had bought this herself. She paid for it. Mm. And uh, the university doesn't pay for things like that. They can't. They're not oh, allowed yes. to. You know, state university, holy smokes. Uh, <laughs> the, the, those farmers in that legislature would blow up the campus if they try to do anything like that. Anyhow, back to the situation. Uh, the Ohio State Glee Club, which is an excellent male, the men's glee club, was there singing the usual songs that you would expect, of course. And it was a great way to walk in and find this going on. I had to go to another affair prior to this. So it was already underway when I arrived. And uh, after they had sung their songs, and 
the exhibit. I think around. the guys yeah. from the Sigma Chi House kidnapped you. Well, we we're, stayed, we were all waiting for you, and then we got word that you had to go lay down because the Sigma Chi guys tired you out. Well, this is true. This is exactly true. Yeah. And uh, so the party was half over before I got there. But anyway, the good goodies were still good, and the people were warm and friendly. How does it feel to be so popular? It feels wonderful. Uh, the trick is not to let your, yourself begin to believe your own press notices. You know, it's yeah. a very dangerous thing. We've seen this happen to good people who begin to think after a while that they really are the way that the, the press notices say Don't you are. think you are as, as good as people I, say you are? I, I know exactly. That's a Barbara Walters type question. Yeah. <laughs> I did an interview with her one time, by the way. Did you? Uh, she wasn't as famous then, so her, her questions weren't as barbed as they were. <laughs> <laughs> we get along fine. Um, well, well, I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to hold you to it. Aren't you as good as people say you are? Uh, I'm as good as I know I am. And if, if we reach an area where I know I'm not that good, I'm not going to give myself away. <laughs> At the same time, I don't want anyone that, who said something nice to think that I'm not grateful for their having said it. Yeah. But it's got to be part of the structure. You know, we've oh, heard yes. it said this many times. It's, it's got to be a tool, a Are, tool for all purposes. I remember when you came back from being invited to dinner at the White House, and I said, well, what was it like? And you said, the first thing you said was, well, I wear, still wear the same size hat. <laughs> was, that was great, too. That was marvelous. Uh, all of these things are simply uh, they're culminations. Uh, in a way, they're milestones, which you watch very carefully, uh, you, the person involved. Because if there hadn't been a White House, there hadn't been a birthday party, I would have I would have blown it somewhere along the line. Uh -huh. You've got to build a career to the point where people want to give you these things. You can't promote it yourself. If, if you uh, give me a for instance, one very well-known cartoonist whose name we won't mention here, once uh, had uh, his representative call and ask if uh, the Cartoonist Society were planning a tribute dinner to his client. And we weren't playing any tribute dinner to his client, and we said so. But the, the guy was hoping that, that maybe this would would occur, and uh, mm. it seems like a spontaneous thing. But uh, it's got to be a spontaneous thing. You can't goose it into being. No. It's got to come from wherever it comes from at the time that it comes. And uh, you simply cannot do an artificial hype of this kind. And this is why you're most grateful for it, because you haven't done a goddamn thing to bring it about except do your job. Yeah. And if that has, has brought it about, then fine. I have my own theories on why you're so popular. Uh, one of the reasons is that all of, none of us can live multiple lives, but we want to. Uh, most, most people are really bored with their own lives, and through an, art, an artisan, uh, through a craftsman, such as yourself, uh, a novelist or so, we can vicariously live many lives uh, and I feel that these lives that you've, that we've lived through you, uh, are so exciting and have added such a dimension to our lives that uh, we feel grateful to you for that. I do you, about do you it, buy that? Uh, well, sure, I understand it because I feel it about other people in, in other areas. Uh, but as far as my own situation is concerned, the things that we have been able to do, been fortunate enough to be able to do such as travel and so forth, have, have uh, all been part of the, of the craft, it's part of learning your trade. You go to China because you want to see what China looks like, and uh, then you can use it later on. And at the same time, of course, you enjoy it. It was great fun to be in Hong Kong and to be in Alaska and to be in Athens and to be in Berlin when they were going to close the, the corridor. It felt like Richard Harding Davis or uh, Bob Cosadine or somebody who really did this professionally for a living. And uh, that part was, was the bonus. That was the, uh, the little uh, extra that you got for just doing your job.